Senator Alex Antic, we're catching up with the South Australian Liberal Senator. He's going to be heading to Canberra soon for Budget Week. Senator, are you excited? I'm very excited, uh, Ricky. Nothing makes me more excited than numbers. <laughs> well, the numbers <laughs> the numbers seem to be coming in on climate science. We've been highlighting this study from the University of Washington, and they've been mm. saying uh, in this research released earlier this month, global warming is widely expected to favour El Niños. We know that all too well from the millennium drought. But uh, mm. lead author Robert Jinglin Wills is saying that uh, we are looking at more continuing La Niñas due to climate change. Are you managing to keep up? No, look, it's hard to keep up. I mean, the science keeps uh, uh, keeps changing, the modelling keeps changing. I mean, you know, realistically, we should be talking from, you know, somewhere about three three metres below sea level at the moment if all the modelling had been accurate. So, I mean, you know, what we have is a natural phenomenon, I think, of, um, uh, you know, La Nina and El Nino, and, and uh, you know, this has been going on for a millennia, um, and now all of a sudden, um, you know, eggheads from the uh, from the University of Washington decide that there's modelling that will tell us something different. Well, who's surprised? The only thing that, that that's shocking about this is that there haven't been more models suggesting that this, you know whether we've got is related to climate change. I mean, I, I just think, you know, at some point, common sense has got to reign in here. And uh, you know, I'm just the, 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 if it's not COVID modelling, it's climate modelling, and I'm looking forward to the day when one of them's accurate. Well, when uh, it comes to this sort of uh, projection, I know that in America they've got severe drought going on. Does every sort of natural disaster fit the narrative on climate change to advance the need for yet more government spending? That's, you've nailed it. That's exactly what it is. In fact, uh, I heard Professor Ian Plymer talk the other week about uh, the nonsense, and, and I, at the time I refused to use the word, but the nonsense of calling the bushfire season from, from two or three years ago unprecedented. It's far from it. I mean, these things are not unprecedented. They've happened for millennia as we've said and um you know it is, it is a very easy thing to do to pick on the, the latest flood or the latest natural disaster and and and, and use it for your your own uh, you know grave and purposes i mean i i just uh, look i think at the end of the day what we're what we're heading into now is a very serious time in world energy you know future and we're seeing that in europe now uh and we're seeing it in australia as well and the price of energy is rising um, it, it's time to sort of blow off the shackles of modelling and, and get a bit serious about this. We're not we're not going to do anything from Australia here where we're less than 1% or just over, I think, maybe now 1% of the world's emissions. Um, let's get real. Well, if the University of Washington are to be believed, if we take that at face value, isn't there a need then to invest, say, in infrastructure to make us more flood-proof now in Australia? We were drought-proofing Australia not long ago. Do we need better rail corridors and better highways so that we don't get flooded out and have other human disasters like we're seeing at the moment? Well, I mean, I think the good part about all of those suggestions is there is a, you know, there's always another use for them. I mean, you know, I think that the concept of more dams and more rail networks and, and you know, flood prevention generally is a, is, is a, is a reasonable thing because we will get flood events due to natural weather cycles. Uh, I mean, you only have to look to the example of the billion dollars we spend, or it might even be more on the detail plant as a knee-jerk reaction to the millennial drought, millennium drought, um, and that's barely been switched on. So... You know, it, it is. I, I, I just this this business about knee jerking policy to whatever the latest bean counter has said in the university really does worry me. And I and I and I just I can see it all happening over and over again to suit political ends. Well, you mentioned uh, previously COVID nineteen. This Mickleham uh, detention centre was developed for people that were coming into the country and didn't tick the COVID boxes. Now that's being <laughs> redeployed as a flood evacuation centre. Yes, and uh, I mean, look, I, I find the whole thing terribly curious. And we've seen the same thing in different states. Of course, there's, there's the one, I think, Howard Springs in the Northern Territory. Governments were very quick to rush to spend hundreds of billions of dollars on these quarantine facilities for COVID when really any sensible prediction would have said that it was going to be a transient phase, you know, this, this the pandemic period. So, you know, what, what's it all about? I mean, what, you, know, you know, these are not, um, you know, athletes' villages at the Olympic Games. They're, they're not easy places to repurpose into accommodation. Um, I think $250 million in the one in in, uh, in Victoria was spent and it's just sitting there lying idle now. Once again, this is the problem when, when governments knee-jerk on, on, uh, on policy like this. Well, when you look at the amount that's being spent on climate change, we started talking about this extended possibility of La Nina going on for other years. You know, in the Victorian um, election campaign for Daniel Andrews at the moment, Labor is spending big on boosting renewable energy zones. I mean, mm. where does the taxpayer funding, you know, into this sort of stop? Where does the industry get a chance to actually yeah. solve these problems themselves? Well, I mean, that's what should happen. Um, you know, we've talked about it before, and in fact, I'm co-signing a bill that 
Senator Matt Canavan has put put forward to the Parliament, which will be coming up fairly soon, about remo- repealing the uh, prohibition on nuclear energy generation, which I think is something we should be talking about more. And of course, the point about that is not to put government subsidies into a, into an industry. It's simply to say, let's get out of the way. Let's remove the prohibition so that the market can tell us whether or not it's profitable. That's what should be happening. We should be allowing. We should be getting government out of the way as much as we absolutely can, and allowing. Uh, the free market to tell us what works and what doesn't. And uh, and so, look, I mean, you know, we've seen billions and billions of dollars spent on renewables. And what's it going to get us? It's going to get us landfill full of solar panels that can't be recycled, that are leaching dangerous chemicals into the into the environment. Um, this is, uh, Ricky, we've talked about it before, but this is a, a very, very poor period of Australian public policy. Yeah, we've been talking about the uh, nuclear conversation for a while here on the air as well. There is market interest in coming into Australia. I think we're one of the only economies that doesn't have uh, nuclear power and others are adding it on. Uh, If there was serious concern about climate change, La Nina and the like, nuclear now has to become part of the conversation. Absolutely right. I mean, nothing says net zero more than 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 a small modular reactor or a system of them. And we're talking about different technology. We're not talking about the big cooling towers of the 1950s, the Chernobyls. I mean, that, that sort of stuff is, is of the past. These are now modular reactors that are being built. They're, they're, they're modular in the sense that they're done in repetition, so that the risk reduction is there. It's like an iPhone. You, know, you don't build one of them and put it somewhere. You build millions of them and put them everywhere. So there's a whole range of reasons why this is safe and increasingly cost-effective. And, and for those that are trumpeting net zero, it's a no-brainer. It has to be on the radar. Now, Senator, just lastly, any exciting news you're hearing whispers about in the budget? Anything we haven't heard about yet that we might be seeing during the week? Look, I, I haven't heard any more than, than you have, Ricky, but um, what, what does please me is the week of budget estimates coming up after that because that's an opportunity for us all to really pick over the, the, the bureaucracy and see where their priorities really lie. Uh, so that, that's the excitement for me. We'll, we'll see what the government comes up with the numbers, but you know, I, I like the opportunity to keep the bureaucrats accountable. Well, it's an opportunity to find out if the definition of a woman has changed since the last time you asked them. <laughs> probably, the modelling's probably changed, so it probably has. <laughs> Senator Alex Antic, Senator for South Australia, thanks for joining us on Flow. Thanks, Ricky.